Hello, I'm Lindley Gooden, reformed journalist and curious human. Welcome back to Explainiacs. Now, this time, I'm very happy to say that we can turn on the creative taps and jump headlong into the world of the dialogue divas, the radio raconteurs, theatre, TV and movie moguls. This time, it's all about script writing, the source of every great play, drama or story. And again, luckily, I know somebody who's lived and occasionally loved the greatest labour of love of them all. He's a writer of more than 25 years. He is Jeremy Hilton Davis. Hello, Jeremy. Good morning, Lindsay. Explainiacs Biography. Good to have you with us. It is amazing to see you again. We're here in the Union Club in London's Treddy Soho, so excuse the occasional bang or crash. It's our breakfast hitting the floor. But let's start with your life so far. Jeremy Hilton Davis has not only been writing for more than 25 years, he's one, been runner-up or nominated for six highly respected writing awards, including a BAFTA. From theatre to radio, film to TV, he works with people behind the likes of The King's Speech and Schindler's List to call The Midwife and EastEnders. And you'll see his name flash up on the screen, often daily, on BBC One's Doctors. He's been there, done a lot of it, and knows a thing or two about how we could perhaps do it too. Okay. Okay, so let's start with a tumble down the rabbit hole. First of all, Jeremy, look, you've been there and done it. What does it take to make writing part of your life? Well, it is a, certainly if you're making screen drama, it's a collaborative business, that's very nature. And you have to enjoy that. And great people will always elevate what you've done. The old adage of surrounding yourself with good people is, is very good indeed, actually, because they, you know, they add luster to your work and take it forward. The first commandment of writing fiction is sit your ass in the chair. Some of us need Velcro pants. You want the work to be seen, but it doesn't have to be at the Odeon. How does it work? Let's talk about how you make your idea your script perhaps, or a half-formed script, into something that can be used, because that seems, I think, to most people as being the, the highest and tallest barrier. Well, the importance in, if, if you're pitching an idea for a visual medium, television or film, you have to be able to see it. Right. And see it immediately, in terms of the commissioner, I would say. Other than that, if you're, apart from story, or you're perhaps pitching for a particular actor, or at a particular budget as well. But those, those are somehow secondary to, to the idea always. I understand that. You, so you, you have to you be able to imagine it and imagine how that story goes. Indeed, well, perhaps the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the most famous or perhaps notorious pitch would be for Alien. And uh, the pitch was Jaws in Space. <laughs> I'd buy it. Resign yourself to writing lots and lots of rubbish. I think that writing is self-hypnosis. Tools of the trade. How do you pitch? an idea or a script? Well, pitching, it's all different manners to do it. Yeah. The ideal pitch, when you think of it in terms of Hollywood, you go into a room and you you throw your basic idea at the people with, with the power and the money. And as William Goldman, the famous screenwriter, said, you, you know, you want a character you like spending time with. Right. You know, Indiana Jones, you always want him to win and he's a very personable character. Yeah. Um, and so, you, you know, you're going to spend an hour and a half, two hours with them. So they better be good characters, really. And of course, story does come into it. What is it actually like to be in that room? And, and is it all nerves or is it, you know, kind of ambition kicking in? How do you, how do you, you know, step forward and put your idea forward in, in the best way from your experience? Well, inevitably, like most things, the more you do it, the better you get at it, really. And if, if you've got full confidence behind your idea or in your idea, then obviously it's easier to pitch than when you're not quite so mm. confident of. Uh, and, and the classic thing is don't pitch something that you're not really wanting to do yourself. Yeah. Yes. And uh, the, the general example being don't pitch the detective on a, who lives on a canal boat with a classic car. Yeah. yeah. Because if you pitch it thinking that's humorous, then someone will commission it and you have to write it. He's, a, he's sort of a maverick. He drives a mini metro. Yes, never pitch not seriously. So pitching is about, you know, just having a really good shape. It's not about having a fully developed script. It's about having no, it's, a great it's, idea. <clears throat> it's the punch of an idea. Yeah. It's, it's seeing what it could be, really. And that's what they have to go with. Moving on. Step two. And now we're talking about, look, the pitch has been accepted. Hey, you're on the road. Somebody likes that idea. How do you start, go from the, you know, the initial idea up to developing a script that you can still see? Well, the next stage of development is normally what they call a treatment, yeah. which is basically the whole, the whole film mapped out in prose form. That, so you could see every scene, how the story develops, how the plot develops. And it's important to know the difference between story and plot. Story being what happens and plot being how it happens. Yeah. Yeah. We are now at step three. 
Whatever industry you're in, you'll develop instinct over the years, and that's, an, you know, that's a gut feeling based on all that information and the experience you've got over the years. So you've got that too, and you've helped other people to understand how this works. What would they come to you with? Would they come to you with, you know, Swallow, the detective in Norfolk, or would they come with something else? It normally is a screenplay, and often it's, it's a first one and it's unformed. What does a screenplay kind of look like? We've seen the results of screenplays, but many of us haven't seen a screenplay in black and white. Well, a screenplay is essentially a blueprint for the finished film, and it looks very much like a blueprint as well. It gives you what the film would look and sound like. Right. But of course, it's not going to look and sound like that completely, because there are many different stages from the, from the page to the screen. What do you have to get right? What sort of elements do you have to get right in, in development to go from the initial idea to something that can be adapted for screen. It is it is a visual medium. They, they were called moving pictures, yeah. so they have to move. And that's also true of story and plot. Uh, and the script has to propel you forward. So each scene should propel you into the next one. And, and especially if you say in terms of thriller, you need jeopardy. You need jeopardy in most stories, Je jeopardy being what happens next. Please prepare for step four. A lot of people who watch a, a good drama on a Sunday night where other nights of the week are available, you might think, well, it's the twist, it's the surprise. And we have a lot of that. There are formulae out there that are nothing but twists. Now, I find those a bit exhausting. I don't know about you. How do you keep that hook going and those twists and those developments of a plot that bring you back in and hook you in? Well, it's interesting you use the word hook because especially in TV drama, that's, that's the word that is used, that's the term. Especially in continuing drama series, normally called soaps. You look at a scene in, in a continuing drama and they will, it will have three beats, as we call them, which is kind of three story points or three plot points rather. Uh, it's what gets you into the scene, uh, what the scene is about, the information or action you're trying to, trying to get over. And the third beat, which is the hook of the scene, is what gets you out and gets you into the next scene to be picked up then by the subsequent first hook of that scene. Yeah, again, it's that propulsion forward, that motion yeah. forward of story. Explainiacs, personal stories and lessons learnt. You've worked through a stage and you've worked through TV and you still write on Doctors on BBC One. I do, yeah. Now, you've worked on that programme for 19 years. It's on every day of the week. And um, how do you come up with a new line, a new story, something that can take your characters that you know really well to another place. Well, the, the serial is established six months ahead, or four six months ahead by story conference. And again, it's it's the same with any drama. People ask how something like Coronation Street could go on for 50 years. I mean, you bring two characters into into a, a situation, and there will be conflict. Yeah. Really. Um, and the more you know, you change those characters around, there'll be different dynamics, different kinds of conflicts. So yeah, it's it's, it's never a problem from that point of view. So you've raised a really important point there which is something that keeps you interested as a writer but also keeps us interested as as watchers viewers is conflict is that is that kind of in some ways at the heart of it that jeopardy that you talked about not just for the process but in terms of the way you write are you looking to butt heads and see what comes out of that well a further truism in a way is that drama is conflict human beings are antagonistic by their very nature yeah anyway. um, but for example the easiest way to develop a plot is to get a character to conceal information or lie because immediately then they have to cover their tracks, make excuses, and there's, there's going to be a point where they forget what they said or, the, you know, or they get found out or there's a clue. And, that, and that's, that's, that's the kind of nub of all, uh, I suppose you might say, detective drama in a way, certainly. So let's, let's take us to the next stage. How do you work well with others? You know, we all suffer from it, I'm sure. Uh, everybody listening to us today will suffer from it, even if you don't admit it to the public. Egos. Well, you have to have a certain amount of ego to want to put what comes out of your head in front of however many million people. Absolutely. Millions of people, yeah. And equally as an actor, you have to have your head projected 30 feet high on a cinema screen and, and what you're doing. You, you, you need a certain amount of ego for that. Saying which, for a num or very great number of the very best actors are shy. Right. And writers too, but writers get to be shy in a room on their own. So that's rather different. Uh, you could argue that it's actually after all those years of burrowing away at your scripts uh, in, a, in, a, in a darkened, a darkened snug in the corner of your gaff, your rented bed set, actually, to have your your name in lights, it's it's well deserved, probably. It's it's what everybody wants. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Anthony Hopkins famously, once he became a star of the National Theatre, said, "Right, I want the limo now." Yes. So, and he did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he certainly he certainly did indeed. Yeah, but in terms of he, no, you, you, he ended up becoming pope, you know. He did become pope. Actually, the two Welsh popes 
being confident in your in your story and confident in, in what you want to put forward is, is fine. Everyone comes into the room with that. But in, into, if it's getting in the way of uh, advancing the project as a whole, and, and especially in terms of a long-running yeah. drama, yeah. yeah, if you have too much ego there, the chances are you won't be working on it that much longer. No, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but it's you know you you, you have to, to give um, due diligence to everyone else who works on it as well, um, and it's 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 the only way those shows in particular can be made if if, if people do do really collaborate in a greater way than anything else. Everybody listening to this on their phone or, or wherever and who watches a bit of telly and a lot of online and maybe listens to a bit of radio and certainly some podcasts, the, the media is changing so quickly. Uh, it's much more on demand. We know this. Everybody knows this. Um, where do you think, from a writer's point of view, uh, the good stuff is in the future? Do you think it's generating your own stuff? Is that the way you as a writer have to be? Well, that's that's quite a broad subject, really. Yeah. Um, I know you're, pre- you're another podcast you've done is about IP intellectual property mm. and that's increasingly a, a, a topic uh, and owning your own work and being a writer producer there, there are so many opportunities but it's so difficult to earn cash from it there's a proliferation of platforms mm. and more people to pitch to I mean, for instance if you go back to the 1980s there were probably only three commissioning editors you could go to in, in Britain obviously lots more than that now and they have the streaming platforms but I think in some ways that makes it harder for someone starting out, especially if they are commissioned to do something and it doesn't quite come off, mm. then getting the second commission might be extremely difficult, if not impossible, really. Um, and something else, that we, because streaming services especially gobble up material so quickly, the lead-in time is very short and so the time for development is, is, is foreshortened as well. Um, and drama films they they do benefit greatly from development yeah the crown is the inverse of that uh, because that keeps getting better and better but there are very many that don't come off that way and, and especially with thrillers you, as you said yourself you get hooked and hooked and hooked on and on and on and you get to the final episode and it's oh really <laughs> that's right that's it and that's that's famously true of, yeah. of some very large series in the last few years it is indeed yes yeah, yeah. we won't say which ones no <laughs> you'll find it don't i'm worry. still looking for work remember so. yeah no, that's right no, it's a brilliant series we loved it um so a couple of quick fire questions who's your writer's writer or your writer writer's I mean, How's that breakfast? for a dramatic interlude? That yes, was yeah. breakfast, right? Yeah. Very many, really. There's, yeah. there's my earliest, I wouldn't say worship, but was astonished by him was Arthur Miller. And Death of a Self has always been a great influence. Uh, I write a lot of comedy. Uh, and so uh, Neil Simon, Alan Aitbourne, contemporary screenwriters like Sarah Phelps, who I knew from university, Agatha Christie's Pale Horse is her latest, and she's a wonderful writer. There's no shortage, are there? I mean, and I suppose perhaps in our on-demand, more on-demand world, as a writer, actually it's the individual projects that you really, that, that have to be highlighted, just like if you're downloading a single from a, from a music artist. Yeah, yeah, but, but even in terms of you know, continuing drama series, which you would think would be anonymous in terms of a writer's tone or yeah. particular imprimatur, but no, you, you can tell who's writing what. Explain Yaks. Lessons to learn. When you were a younger writer, if somebody had thrown light on one particular era of writing or had told you something that was just golden information, what would have been the most important advice that they could have given you earlier in life? Well, it carries on from our last topic, really. Be yourself. Right. Write what you want to write. And as I am going going back to Cardiff to start on a, a short film for the BBC co- comedy film, and that's kind of uh, right back to where it started in the way. Uh, well, tell us about commissioning in Wales, because actually, you know, because of where you're from, but also your passion for Welsh theatre, for you know, for having that that line in, has been so important over the years. Uh, yes, it has. Yeah, um, I don't know what's it, it hasn't been a deliberate thing in a way. Um, but there obviously has always been that link mm. as well. And it was nice to go back a few years ago and, and do a Radio 4 play, yeah. uh, which I wrote for the actors Mark Lewis Jones and Richard Harrington called One Horizon. That was a joy in terms of the story I envisaged coming out just as I wanted it, but larger and better and bigger and with absolute luster on it. And that's uh, something I'm really, really, really proud of. Yeah. Yeah, luster will be one of those words that comes through this um, when you can work with others and, and get those inspirations and those just their individual takes. That's that's the whole idea. Yeah, because I mean that carries you on and drives you on as well, really, which is important. Final thing, after after these many years, do you still love it? Yes, I do. Yeah, 
Uh, if, if you like a life of certainty and order, then it's not for you particularly. Equally, if you don't like being in a room on your own, although at this point in history, that's not a bad thing either. Yes, I have very many friends saying, oh, self-isolation, welcome to our world. It's a way of life if you want it to be a life. And in some ways it has to be, because otherwise it's, it's a very difficult life if you don't, if you don't want to live that way. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Well, I can't thank you enough for inviting me to the Union Club. It's been lovely, actually. It's been a few, a few clatters and a few breakings here and there, but uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. Pleasure. Well, that is, uh, that's it for this episode of Explainiacs. We'll definitely come back to this subject. There's so much more to see and, and to do as well. But for now, it's time to jump into somebody else's world. And if you know somebody who's just too interesting to ignore, who can explain to the rest of us how it all works in their area of expertise, their life. We'd really love to hear from you. It couldn't be easier. Just get in touch at explainiacs.com and we'll hear you when you get in touch. For now, thanks very much to Jeremy and, uh, you know, keep your eyes peeled and you'll see his next creation very soon. From me, have a very happy onward journey. See you again in a couple of weeks' time. Bye-bye.